Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on success in academia for early career researchers. I am Sina Muradi, CIB program manager and postdoctoral researcher of construction management at Tampere University in Finland. Let's take a look at uh, the agenda for this webinar. Uh, today, uh, this is truly a privilege to have uh, four distinguished professors here in this webinar as the keynote speakers who are also editor-in-chiefs of very well-known journals. So, uh, Professor Chimai Anumba, Professor Martina Hohmann, Professor Ralph Muller, and Professor Natalie Droin are our uh, keynote speakers today. Uh, and uh, after uh, the keynote speeches, we will have a panel discussion and QA session at the end. So let's start with the first keynote speech by Professor Chimai Anumba from University of Florida. Thank you very much. I will try to share my screen. Please let me know if you don't see it. Uh, yes, just a moment, uh, Chimai. I will make you the co-host so that you can. Okay. Okay, now you can uh, share your slides with us. All right, okay. Can you see my screen, man? Yes, yes. But your voice is very strong. You might. It's very. Uh, yes, yes, we can see your slides. Okay, and you can hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. All right, so good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to um, share with you a few ideas on how to succeed in academia. Um, I called it perspectives because I think there are lots of different perspectives. And uh, so in terms of what I'll cover, uh, I'll go through some definition, I'll talk about number perspectives, what constitutes success, what do some case studies of so-called successful academics, and then look at metrics of success, uh, have a few additional considerations, talk about strategies for young, early career academics, and then talk about strategies for older academics, and then conclude. So um, I think the first thing is really looking at definitions. What do we actually mean by success? And um, sometimes looking at the dictionary calls it the, um, Achievement of something desired, planned, or attempted, the gaining of fame, prosperity, or status. And then you look at what was the definition of academic. Uh, and typically, uh, you have definitions such as pertaining to a university or institution of learning, and then uh, also scholarly to the point of being practical or unaware of the outside world, uh, mainly theoretical, speculative. So if we're using those two definitions, then do we, when we talk about success in academia, uh, are we talking about excelling at being irrelevant to the outside world? Uh, does it actually exist? Uh, what is the benchmark for success? What are the criteria for success? What are the, uh, and from whose perspective? And is it worth aspiring to for uh, early career academics? And so there are lots of different perspectives. Uh, some are discipline-specific papers and books. Uh, and I'll, I'm just highlighting a few here. Um, there's uh, Psychology 101 and have the unspoken rules for success in academia. Uh, there is an article in the Times Higher by Lincoln Allison called How to Succeed in Academia. And I'll ha highlight some of that because a lot of it is uh, tongue-in-cheek, uh, but it's actually quite funny. Uh, and then another one is how to succeed in academia, or initially I think he called this or die trying, uh, but then he crossed that out and said, or oh, have fun trying. 
um, by Lars Pedersen from NYU. And then there's a couple of articles um, that, again, intended to be a little tongue-in-cheek as well. Uh, one is 10 rules for succeeding in academia through upward toxicity uh, by Irina Dumitrescu from University of Bonn in Germany. And then, uh, and then 10 rules for possibly succeeding in academia through upward kindness, which is almost like a response to Irina uh, by John Tregonin from Imperial College. So you have a lot of uh, perspectives there. Um, Alison's 10 point guide I found really funny. Uh, and you can look it up uh, yourselves at some point. Uh, but it says, uh, first of all, choose your subject with care. Uh, create a network with other universities. Internationalize your network. Monopolize output in the field. Produce a lot of words. Minimize contact with students. Develop personal gravitas. Create, cultivate an air of authority. Bargain to boost your reputation and then resist the voices of self-doubt. And you need to read what he actually wrote on some of these. So I'll just read a few just to um, give you a sense of the tone of uh, what, he, what he wrote. Um, so I'll read, let me see which one or two I'll read. Um, so one of them, this is the actual uh, excerpt from the article. Um, uh, and one is, okay, let me read number four. Uh, monopolize output in the field. It says your network must control output in the field, create a journal, the editorial board being the network, publish each other's works, but make sure that publishers and grant giving bodies do not go outside the network in deciding whether to publish or give away money. Uh, you'll be guaranteed some sales of books because you recommend each other's works to students. If an outsider appears in the field, you must decide on rejection or incorporation. Either ring everyone else to say how insubstantial his or her work is, or ring him or her to say how much you admired it, or both. Uh, so you can see it's all very tongue-in-cheek and, um, and very interesting. Uh, and then number five, it says, produce a lot of words. It does not matter whether the words are original or interesting, whether anybody ever reads them, it is best if they do not, or whether they are pretty well the same words you produced last year. You already control the means of publication and assessment. So uh, again, this is all very tongue in cheek, uh, but that's, it just has the whole, uh, that air of uh, sarcasm, uh, but also a grain of tr uh, truth in some of what he said. So uh, I'll move on from this. Uh, I don't have time to read them all, but it's, uh, it's an interesting piece. So then what actually constitutes academic success? Uh, is it a completion of a PhD in the US? Uh, we uh, focus a lot on people getting tenure uh, from transitioning from assistant professor to uh, associate professor. Um, is it when you become a full professor? Is it when you win a Nobel Prize? Is it when you have uh, peer esteem and everybody recognizes you as an authority in the field? Uh, or is it when you've made a lot of money uh, from your work? So what exactly do we mean by uh, success? And then, so I decided to come up with a number of case studies of so-called successful academics and I'll put a disclaimer here. Uh, any resemblance to any academic dead or alive is entirely a figment of your imagination. Okay. So um, I have three academics. Uh, one is Professor Flintstone. Uh, he's 58. He has a worldwide reputation. He has over 400 papers and books, very high citation index, numerous <laughs> international awards. His wife left him as he preferred his work to her. He exploits his research students who don't keep in touch once they graduate. So think about this, is he a successful academic? 
Then there's Professor Bloggs, he's 38. He became full professor at 35. He has hundreds of papers. There's no clear track record of research grants or PhD supervisions. He understands and exploits the system. He is unable to discuss, quote unquote, his papers with peers. Uh, and then he is the dean's favorite, definitely destined for senior management. Then we have uh, <clears throat> Dr. Johnson, 50. She's highly respected worldwide. Lots of patents, visiting professorships, awards. Excellent set of publications. She's loved by her students for her kindness. <clears throat> and personal touch, uh, but she's failed twice to be promoted to full professor uh, due to internal politics and uh, DEI issues, the diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. She does have a happy family life. So the question is, which academic was the most successful? Usually when I have a, an interactive session with uh, early career researchers, we actually debate this and, uh, and then you have a number of people go for any one of those three as the most successful. Uh, but really it all depends on the perspective and the metrics that you apply. <laughs> so in terms of metrics of success, I think there are formal metrics and then there are others. Uh, formal metrics, we are familiar with publications, research income, uh, the number of PADs you've supervised, <laughs> peer esteem, citations, impact, tenure, <laughs> evaluations, your professional profile in terms of service, and then others in terms of fame. Uh, are you always on the news network talking about your work? Uh, are you profiting from your work, um, media exposure and power? There are also several personal metrics and this all self-defined. So what, a number of things to say, academia has much better defined metrics than most industry sectors. Uh, when I finished my PhD, I went to work in industry as a consulting civil structural engineer. And there wasn't a very clear path to how do I become a director of this company? Uh, in academia, you have some very clear metrics. You've got to publish, you've got to do uh, advice PhD, you've got to teach and all of that. Uh, and I also emphasize to early career researchers, it's important to exceed the threshold requirements. Uh, and just hypothetically, if you need 10 papers to progress to the next stage, don't aim for 10 papers. You should aim for like 12 or 15. You need to exceed the threshold because you don't want your case to be discussed. Uh, there's no substitute for quality work or excellence. Uh, and then we need to also recognize that typically women and minorities tend to be underrepresented at some of those more senior levels. And the question typically is, are they being undervalued because of their backgrounds or is it really uh, a fair uh, assessment of their success? Okay, so, Strategies for young academics. This is not my 10 point plan or 12 point or 13 point plan, just a few things that I thought I'd put down. One is define your own metrics for success. Uh, and that should include some of the more formal metrics because you can, if your own personal metrics are totally different from what you will be assessed on, then you're not going to get the recognition in your institution. So your own metrics need to include some of the uh, formal metrics. You must find a mentor. I can't overemphasize over this. Um, I've benefited from uh, from mentors, and I've thankfully been, ha been had the opportunity to mentor some others. It's very important. Uh, work hard. You must work hard. You must generate the outputs that are needed. Uh, you need to ensure your work is both rigorous and of high quality. You need to enjoy your work and be, be happy. If you don't enjoy what you're doing, then maybe go find something else. Uh, you need to maintain a healthy work-life balance. You, uh, we typically talk about work hard, play hard. Uh, a lot of us still struggle with this balance. Uh, There's something to focus on. Uh, Showing appropriate practices. There are lots of uh, bad actors in the academy. Uh, you need to figure out how to avoid those. Uh, collaborate. Uh, there's a lot of um, value in collaboration. Uh, a lot of the big societal issues that we address require people to collaborate across disciplines. 
And I think it's very important you identify who you can collaborate with. And then a more controversial one that I often mention is follow the money. Uh, when I say follow the money is if you need to, these days to do any sort of meaningful research, um, you need to have the money to actually do the work. And so you need to figure out, okay, if I'm interested in the design of cups, for example, uh, and nobody is funding the design of cups, then what exactly are they funding? Um, and so how do you try to either spin or uh, my, uh, focus what you're doing on where you can actually attract funding uh, or uh, review uh, what areas you're looking at? Uh, you need to treat others fairly, but also you need to develop a thick skin. It's not everybody you treat fairly that will reciprocate. Okay. Don't take yourself too seriously. This is the root of arrogance in the academy. And I tell people you must uh, you must do the work, but you must not take yourself so seriously that you think everybody else is beneath you. Uh, you need to be patient. Success does not happen overnight. Um, I, I think a firm, famous sports person said it took me 20 years to become an overnight success. Uh, and so people see the success, but they don't realize all of the hard work that's gone into it. And then build a supporting infrastructure. You need a supporting infrastructure in terms of uh, people that give you emotional support, people that you collaborate with, people that uh, act as a sounding board, your mentor will be part of that infrastructure, your friends, um, your colleagues in other university. That is very important. Okay. Then older academics, uh, I always include this slide because I know early career researchers will transition to become older. Uh, is it too late? Uh, it never, I don't think it's ever too late. You must always set new goals. Uh, you need to mentor younger academics. They don't need to suffer because you did. Uh, there are a lot of people in the academy. It took me 10 years to go from my PhD to tenure to full professor. Therefore, anybody wanting to go any sooner cannot do it. Uh, I, I don't think people need to suffer just because you did. And if you didn't succeed, however you define that, you can be a success in helping others succeed. And if you did succeed, then share your secret and then be successful. So to conclude, um, Success in academia is sometimes regarded as an oxymoron. Uh, I also sometimes define it as fiction, uh, the, the elements of fact, but also elements of fiction, because some people you think are successful are not really successful, and those you think are not very successful are actually uh, highly successful in what they do. And again, it depending on the metrics used is re relative both at individual level, disciplines, institutions, countries, and so on. Uh, it is achievable. It is worth aspiring to, uh, but it's not worth dying for. You don't need to succeed at all costs. I think that's uh, all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anumba, for the great presentation. Uh, let's continue with Professor Martina Holman from UCL and her presentation. Uh, let me let just. I don't have any slides here. Uh, okay. I will just be talking. Okay. So thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk here. So I'm just wondering if you can uh, uh, put me on the on the big screen so people can see me because I decided to do it a little bit personal and I will talk about my career as an example of a female career and uh, kind of uh, of course it's it, it's in my context yeah so my career, I would say, in academia started some 30 years ago um, when I decided to do a PhD in project management. And uh, I'm, I'm Austrian. I'm raised in Austria. I started my career at VU Vienna. 
and uh, you need to know uh, that, of course, uh, there's a, a certain system in every university system. So uh, we have a chair system, uh, and I would say it's a rather a hierarchical working uh, system, uh, not only in Austria, but I would say in most of the German speaking countries and most of the universities there. And actually it was definitely when I started some 30 years ago. And uh, so this is also uh, necessary that you understand the context where I'm coming from, because I would say there is no right and there's no wrong. And uh, for me, it was very very uh, early clear that I wanted to have children and that I wanted to uh, not only uh, look and pursue a career, but uh, already during my studies, I got attracted by projects and I worked uh, in projects that were uh, research projects and education projects. And so I did a lot of traveling. And when there was a chair established at VU Vienna, I took the opportunity and introduced myself there and I was taken and got the opportunity to do a PhD and uh, you know um my uh my professor he was responsible for a postgraduate program uh international project management and uh, I also had the opportunity and uh, he provided me a lot of opportunities um, to attend that because there was no project management teaching back then uh, at my university, um, except for the postgraduate course. Yeah, And I ended up uh, with 20 people in the room. It was uh, 19 men and me, and it was 19 technicians and me. Uh, and I think that says a lot uh, already about uh, the field uh, that I'm in. And um, I'm glad that that has uh, changed over the years. Um, uh, now at VU, responsible uh, for uh, an MBA on strategic project management. And we also have some 20, 25 people. And it's kind of half, half. Yeah. And you see that people are coming from very different backgrounds. Yeah. Not only technicians, not only infrastructure, uh, but also very much uh, consulting, uh, personal development, uh, also human resource management, change. Yeah. You call it. Yeah. It's kind of uh, very, very different backgrounds. And I think this reflects very nicely uh, how project management has evolved as a field and uh, also how uh, we researchers have opportunities to research not only infrastructure context and building context, but also very different contexts. And I think that has attracted also different uh, people into the career. So coming back to my career, so some 30 years ago, and I started with uh, my PhD there, and uh, I got a lot of opportunities. Yeah, I, I engaged with IPMA uh, on a very young age. Uh, I was uh, kind of taken to all the uh, council meetings, and I uh, was learning how uh, consultancy, I was learning training. I, I, the only thing what I did not learn is really how to write papers and how to do proper methodology. Uh, that is a very central skill. And of course, uh, I had to learn it uh, by myself. And I think this is very often still the case in uh, in many uh, universities today. Some do have a very proper education and give the PhD students the tools. Others, uh, they don't. Yeah, so I think this is this is something uh, we need to be aware of. And uh, uh, here's also Ralph and Natalie, and we have tried as uh, the editors of the leading journals in the field of project management to contribute also to the uh, development uh, of uh, the project management field and also help uh, young people to understand uh, what skills they need and also offer uh, workshops uh, on case studies and give feedback and so on. So I think uh, there's a lot of things that had not been available that easily when I started my career. Um, but what I found was very early on a mentor. Yeah, And uh, outside my uh, university, outside 
my university in the field of project management. And uh, this mentor, uh, we have become close friends. And uh, he opened up another other doors for me. Yeah, so kind of also uh, got me entrance uh, into more research fields, into research conferences. Um, and so what I'm saying with that is that uh, I, I do not uh, kind of uh, regret that uh, where I started, what I have learned there. Yeah, because these were also important skills. Yeah, so I learned uh, how to teach and I love teaching. I, I love researching. Yeah, so I, over the years, I think what I think what makes my career successful in my eyes is that I had been able to put it all together, what was fun for me and uh, teaching, uh, also some consulting work. I do that still. Uh, researching, research uh, grants with other people, working together, shaping the community, uh, helping to build up uh, project management streams at uh, European Academy of Management, for instance, being very instrumental in further developing the field. So I think this is this is very much uh, what helped me a lot of traveling also, yeah, things that that I really love. And I think what I think is why my career is successful and I'm now full professor uh, for major infrastructure delivery at UCL. And I only became that recently because I spent most of my time in, in Austria and in Vienna, I've been professor there, uh, but uh, I did not want to move without uh, kind of destroying and disturbing my family too much. Yeah. So here comes a very personal decision I'm just sharing uh, with you. Yeah. So the question is, I had very nice offers the way along. Yeah? And the question is, is it worthwhile to get the, the, the boys? I have two boys. They are now grown up um out of school and kind of force them into another life yeah it's not their choice um uh, it's it's my choice it's the mother's choice yeah so i mean this is a decision you make and this is uh if you decide differently that's also not wrong yeah i think this is just saying uh, something what is important to you in that particular situation and for me personally um there are learnings yeah. Um, and uh, one of the learnings, uh, Shima, you mentioned that, uh, be patient with yourself. Yeah. Don't compare yourself with others. Yeah. So I had uh, times in my career when I thought, well, everything what I have achieved is nothing in comparison. Yeah? Somebody else has much, much more citations and much more papers and so on. Yeah. But at the end of the day, um, yeah, the question is what counts, yeah, and this is a per personal decision what counts for you, yeah, and uh, for me it was always important to remain authentic, yeah, and uh, quite humble and cooperative, yeah, so I like to work together with other people, I like to, to shape uh, the field, and I think uh, even... If I, I don't have been professor with 30 or 35 years, uh, I'm now uh, over 50. Um, I think for me, this is adequate. Yeah. So this is this is this is just my my way. And I think we should when we talk about career, um, everybody has a career. Yeah. So a career is just a, a kind of your professional life, your steps, you going. And the question is, are you happy with your career or not? Yeah, and I think this happiness and the possibility of balancing your private life, and uh, because at some point you will retire, and then the question is, what is your private life? Yeah, and what I have learned over the years is how important a private life, uh, and uh, of course my family, and was it always easy? No, it was not. Yeah. Uh, having two young children, but also wanting to go to different conferences. So my partner had to take over a lot and also my family took over a lot uh, of work here. And I'm always saying without my family and the support system I had there, I would not have, I would not stand where I'm standing here now. Yeah? And um, I think what is important for me is uh, to give back 
and uh, also promote a little bit this uh, picture that that you are patient with yourself. You don't need to be a lonely wolf. Yeah, you don't need to be kind of take everything on your shoulders and do it all by yourself. But uh, I think also looking around a little bit and and seeing how the others are doing and joining forces, uh, not only with the professors, but also with the people, uh, with your peers, yeah, kind of uh, finding collaboration possibilities. Uh, I think this is something that is very central to me. And uh, I'm now mentoring young people and I enjoy it. And I also enjoy my PhD students and I'm very proud uh, if they are successful. Um, so I think this is, this is, um, this is nice, yeah. So this is nice, and this is for me success, yeah. So it's it's not necessarily always uh, just measured in how often you are cited, but it is how it feels, and uh, if you are able also to to remain authentic and uh, what you're contributing to the field, yeah. So my field is uh, project management. And I'm very happy uh, that uh, I'm able to kind of uh, create opportunities and uh, kind of take the field forward, not only research-wise, but also kind of giving uh, new ideas, new opportunities, uh, being editor of uh, uh, one of the leading journals, uh, establishing another journal. So, I mean, these were always kind of some entrepreneurial activities I was also looking for and that shaped my career yeah and uh, so i'm last but not least the, the last sentence i want to share with you is um well you know uh we have the tendency maybe to perfect to be perfectionists yeah but the perfect is the enemy of the good and just as a little anecdote i remember that must have been one of my first presentations in front of some 200, 300 people. And I was invited to sit on a panel and I was so nervous and I was up all, all night uh, practicing because I just wanted to do it perfectly. Yeah, You know what happened during the panel? I fell asleep Yeah, because I was just so tired. So I was just sleeping in front of these 250 people and that learned me a lesson, yeah? So a little bit less preparation uh, would have been more uh, appropriate in some situations, yeah? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hohmann, for this insightful speech. Uh, we will reflect on that later on in the panel discussion, but let's continue with uh, Professor Raf Muller uh, from BI Norwegian Business School. And uh, let me. Okay, now you can share your uh, slides with us. Uh, you are on mute. Okay, now you should be able to hear me. Yes. Okay, very good. Yeah, sorry for that. Um, yeah, my name is Ralph Miller. I'm a professor in project management at BI Norwegian Business School and uh, editor in chief of the project management journal. Um, I joined academia relatively late in my life, did my doctorate at the age of 45, and uh, then moved from a career in the industry in project management to, uh, to the academic world and found that there's quite a bit of a difference between the industry and the academic life. Good, so what I wanna talk about is um, 
um, the uh, career as such, yeah, or in other words, what do we mean by by career? Yeah, um, the Oxford Dictionary says it's an occupation undertaken for a significant period of a person's life and with opportunities for progress. And it's interesting that they say progress because that is perfectly in line with what Martina just said and, and uh, Chima said earlier, yeah, that it, it's your own interpretation um, when it comes to progress or success here yeah, for some people. Success and progress is when they learn something new. Yeah, for others, it is a position. Yeah, like an associate professor and professor. For others, it is uh, getting positive feedback after teaching a class on a subject. Yeah, so um, um, let's keep that that word career and and the progress related to it open as it is. Yeah, and not not only re reflected towards. Um, ranks like professors or associate professors or so. Yeah. So the, the the presentation that I will give is or has the objective to give you some food for thought, some hints, insights, yeah, and learn a little bit about some of the key challenges and opportunities that I observed. And uh, as a disclaimer up front, I have not done an academic study on the subject. All you hear from me uh, today is personal reflections on what I have seen or partly experienced myself. Yeah. So the empirical evidence of the sample size is one. <laughs> so you could say it's it's a single case study that I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, let's start with, with the idea of um, careers in academia in terms of roles yeah, and their relationships. So we have roles related to administration or management. Yeah, I put that in one box because I see so, so many links between administration and management in, in academic institutions that I could not put the word management in there. I had a moral problem um, uh, having a, uh, a separate box for, for management at university. So it falls in my world all under admin. Um, so the, the admin role is, is one you can make a career in. Yeah, the other is teaching. Yeah. So obviously at universities, we teach a lot, but in order to, to get into a teaching role, you have to apply for, for a position at the university to do that. And what they will look at is your publication record. Yeah, so publishing is a kind of a necessity to become a teacher in many universities. Yeah, so when it comes to publishing, how can you do that? There are two ways. You either write textbooks where you read a lot what other people have researched and then put that in, into a textbook, or you do your own research yeah, and publish that and become um, known for your published research. And if you have done both your research and your publishing, then you probably have the requirement, fulfilled the requirements for supervising um, PhD and, and, and master students, etc. So often supervision is tied to teaching and research roles. Yeah. So uh, th there are obvious links between those roles. And as I, I said, I personally see publishing as a, uh, one, one of the key elements enabling to get a, uh, a position in teaching at a university and enabling to get a position for research in the university. So I will, I will focus mainly on, on these two things in the slides to come. So, uh, the question that, that, that I want to address is how to set the stage for doing good research and getting published. And from my sample size one observation viewpoint, I observed that there is a kind of a flock rule in the academic world where a senior bird takes a junior bird under its wings until the junior bird can fly by itself. Yeah, we, we see that with the supervision of doctoral students, for example. But we also see that with postdoctoral students or even in uh, mid-career or uh, more senior um, uh, groups of, of academics, we see that sometimes the, the more experienced one takes the 
less experienced one under the wings and, and helps the person until uh, the person can do the work by himself or herself. Yeah, so that puts some requirements on, on the senior bird. Yeah, the senior bird should be a, a person who can make sure that the younger bird gets established in the in in the community that uh, that he is supposed to work in. Yeah, I personally had a number of uh, doctoral students and others who contacted me by saying my supervisor is a very friendly person and he's great in let's say organization theory but he has very little understanding of project management. So um, how can I get into the community of project management researchers? Yeah, and I told these people which conferences to go, what texts to read, which people to talk to, and which other engagements that they should, should work with. So in, in, in other words, if, you, if your formal supervisor might is is not the, the, the best person to uh, help you getting established in the in the world of project management for example yeah then there is always the opportunity of informal senior birds yeah you just have to have the guts to talk to them yeah so we, and they they are typically quite open to do that as i said i, I did that with quite a number of uh, doctoral students which were never formally my doctoral students but i helped them along the way uh, to to build their own career, yeah. and that that works for quite a while, and then there comes the point when uh, when you, uh, as a young researcher, um, has established yourself, and you you still work together with your with your senior bird, but you also want to pursue your own direction. You you pursue your own. Uh, fields of interest in, in research, yeah, and then comes a time where you should consider letting go, yeah. So you you might divert into into different areas, and that's absolutely fine, yeah. That that's uh, um, absolutely okay because you will then build your own network and uh, pursue things that are very interesting for you, are probably not necessarily interesting for the one who brought you into the community. So when it then comes to doing the research, uh, doing your, your work in, in academia, there are a few things you should, should be um, uh, aware of. Like when you look for topics, look for contemporary topics. Yeah not yet another success factors for, for projects in the construction industry, yeah? Not yet another time optimization technique, yeah? Not another add-on to earned value and, and these kind of things. Yeah. Look at new things, yeah? How to build um, resistant, resilient projects that can master the, the SDG challenges, yeah? Look in, into, um, bigger things, looking into the stuff that is hot in in the uh, in, in in the newspaper and in uh, in, in in our um, research journals, yeah, and um, build that all on interesting questions. Now you might say, um, where do I get the ideas from for 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 research topics? And there's, there are quite a number of, of sources for that. Yeah? For example, the calls for papers by the journals, they look, typically look two years ahead. Yeah? Because if they come up with a call for paper, the actual publication of, of that uh, uh, special issue then is in approximately two years. Yeah? So what are the hot, hot topics they, they address? Yeah? For, for example, I know that um, uh, IJPM with, with Martina, they have um, a, a few Calls for, calls for paper out, which are very future oriented. Yeah, I know from from uh, the International Journal of Managing Projects in Business uh, from, from uh, Natalie, they look into AI in in, in an upcoming um, special issue. So these are the the sources that help you find um, topics for your for for your work. Yeah, and then also attend conferences and look at the trends over there. Yeah, um, and and. Be very careful in picking up stuff where already hundreds of papers exist. And just as a hint, yeah, 
the most papers exist in the area of risk management. Yeah, so um, you might not want to add an, another paper that is very, very rarely read. Yeah, so um, look at stuff that is of interest for the community and, and for for the world right now or in the future. Yeah. Then when it comes to getting published, yeah, um, read the editorials of the the three journals that are presented in this uh, uh, conference today. Yeah, we have all um, put our um, editorials online so that you can download it and you can learn a lot about how to find topics. Uh, you can learn about what is a theoretical contribution. You can learn about case studies. You can learn about how to report quantitative, qualitative studies, etc., etc. So these editorials are essential knowledge for making sure that you get through the uh, peer review process. Now, once in there, um, you will automatically, or almost automatically, experience that your work gets rejected. Yeah, but that is part of the game. It happens to all of us. You just have to continue. You work on, on the improvement of your paper or uh, um, uh, send it to another journal. Yeah, um, But don't give up. Yeah, Sooner or later, it will get published. Yeah. When you write your papers, um, you might have heard from the meet the editor sessions that the, the three editors who are in this session today have given before. Uh, we all look for good theoretical contributions, not statistical exercises, yeah? So if you do a quantitative study, it's, it's fine that you use um, statistical uh, methods, but the, the result of a statistic is not the end of a, uh, a paper. Yeah, it is the beginning of theorizing. Yeah, so what does the statistical results tell us and how can that be phrased in a, in a, uh, a theory, a piece of knowledge of general interest for the community? Good, making your way forward, how to do that? Um, um, as, as we had before, I uh, distinguish between early stages and medium stages in the career of people. So in the early stages, I already said, yeah, find your mentor, your supervisor, your senior bird who helps you get along. Yeah, but also find your particular niche. Yeah, look into an, a, a topic or a, a field of topics that uh, can motivate you for many years to come because you will share quite a, a large part of your life with that particular topic. Yeah, so don't take something that is of minor interest for you, yeah. Uh, when you do the, the, the PhD or when, when you do a, a, a research education, you need to be prepared for an emotional roller coaster. There will be times when you are very excited about the, 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 the first um, questionnaire you have developed and send out and it went out to thousands of people just a week later, you realize nobody answers it. Yeah, so it goes up and down all, all the time. And that's that's also a thing that is part of the game. You need you need to develop that thick skin, as uh, Chima said, to, um, to master these things. At the medium stages, um, I think people with a little bit more experience they should find their collaborators and maintain the network of collaborators. Yeah, um, it's it's very important um, to to work in groups because as a lonely wolf, uh, it's it's difficult to exist, uh, as as Martina already said. Yeah, then develop your niche in terms of topic and focus on on the things in there. But while doing that, maintain a work life balance. And remember what I said in the beginning, for almost any role you apply for at a university, they first look into what has he or she published. Yeah. So in other words, always publish, 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 and yes, publish. Good. Then there are a few issues. Uh, if you work at a, at a university or academic institution, they want you to be a comprehensive academic. And that means you should be part of committees, you take on administrative roles, you do a lot of teaching. And outside of the university, you might arrange conferences, workshops, et cetera, et cetera. And that all takes time. Yeah. 
So the question you need to balance is how much time do you allow for these tasks? And believe me, you cannot do all of them. Yeah, you need to be selective. In order to save or spare the time, you need to stay competitive as a researcher. Coming back to what I said in the beginning, almost every time you apply at a, at a university, they first look at your publications. Yeah, make sure you publish, and for that you need time. Yeah. So even if you take on a, a committee work or administrative work here, yeah, ask yourself how long can you be out of research before you have to start from scratch? Yeah. The the um, half time worth of um, of knowledge nowadays is is at two years. Yeah. So if you take on a three year appointment in a full time administrative role, you may have to start from scratch again with your researchers with research. Yeah. With uh, uh, no knowledge of recent developments, no data, no collaborators. Yeah. Can you or do you really want to do that? Yeah. Moreover, will you have the energy and patience to start over? when you come back after five years of having an, an administrative appointment. Yeah. So take these things into account. Another thing, another issue, um, and that's the last issue I, I have, is balancing sitting, citizenship versus impact. But what do I mean with that? Citizenship relates to your in, institution. So in other words, do you want to do what the institution wants you to do? Yeah, so you publish only in the journals that are advocated by your institution. Yeah, if I would do that for for my in my institution, I would probably have a quarter of the citations that I have today. Yeah, because they they want would want me to publish in psychology journals or in four star journals uh, where nobody reads about project management. Yeah, so um, in in other words. You have to decide, do you, do you want to be a good citizen or do you want to make an impact? Yeah, so the, these, it's, it's quite difficult to, to balance, yeah. So when it comes to, to uh, citizenship at, at your institution, yeah, uh, think twice on every time they ask you to take on non-research tasks. But if you want to focus on a career within the institution, that might be the way to go. Yeah, that's your decision. Yeah. On the other hand, if you want to make an impact on your academic community, you better publish in the journals that have a high impact on your thematic community. On the, in, in my world, it would be the project management world. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, the focus is more, more on a career within the global researcher community, not so much within the institution that employs me. Yeah that the downside of that is that you might be required to do some disobedience to your institution by publishing in, in, in journals that they do not appreciate. Yeah. So uh, the question for you is to what extent can you balance these two perspectives or will you go strictly for one of the two? Good. Uh, summing up, yeah, what, what I talked about was being aware of the relationship between academic roles, yeah, publishing, doing research is central for many careers in many roles. Yeah. At the early phases, uh, remember the flock rule yeah, um, to establish yourself, find seniors, be, whether it's formal or informal, does not matter, but find your senior bird that helps you to identify which conferences to go, which um, uh, people to work with, uh, which subjects to take on, et cetera, et cetera, and start build your network for future studies. At the later phase, then build and maintain your network of collaborators. Yeah, remember they are your investment capital. Yeah, they they pull you out uh, out of the swamp when when, when you struggle. Yeah, and sometimes you pull them out of the swamp when they struggle, but together you are successful. Yeah. And last not least, balance institutional citizenship and academic impact. Yeah. And make sure you deliberately choose your career, not necessarily the career that your institution wants from you. Okay. And with that, I finish. Thank you very much, Professor Muller, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, let's uh, continue with Professor Natalie Groin, which is our last uh, keynote speech today, but not least. Yes, please uh, 
Uh, I need to make you co-host just a minute. Now you can share your slides with us and uh, perhaps unmute. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> it was not very <laughs> useful. I was talking to myself. Um, uh, so thank you, uh, Sina and uh, CIB, for inviting uh, us today for share uh, to share our views on uh, how we can embrace the path of success in academia. So my name is Nathalie Drouin. I'm the uh, chairholder of a research chair uh, called Infra S on the social value of infrastructures. I'm also a professor at the uh, University of uh, Quebec, which is uh, based in uh, Montreal, Canada, and the editor in chief of the International Journal of Managing Projects and uh, Business. I have to say that I got my PhD uh, 20 years. 20, more than 20 years ago uh, uh, from Cambridge University in uh, England. And uh, during this period, um, I took the opportunity to uh, not only finish a PhD uh, after many years, but also to have two kids uh, at the same time. While, while I was doing my, my PhD, I also have my two kids. And uh, I, find, I find it as a fantastic opportunity because, you know, I, I had freedom writing my PhD. And I, at the same time, uh, I was able to look after my kids. And I have to admit that uh, I wrote some chapters just with one foot, just, you know, uh, taking care of my, my my son while I was wa uh, writing my chapters. So I was balancing him in his little chair and I was writing chapters at the same time. So if I could make it, you can also make it too. <laughs> so it's not impossible. Um, what I would like um, to, to share with you is that um, really I'm very uh, happy and glad to be here with you because uh, it is really with great enthusiasm and admiration for your commitment to the pursuit of knowledge and the, no and the noble path of academia that you join us today and, and see what you can learn from experienced uh, academics. As you embark on this uh, journey, uh, I would like to share with you some insights. And in a sense, this is quite interesting that I'm the last one. Sometimes it's really difficult to be the last one after such good presentation. But in a sense, my presentation is a sort of summary of what I've been said uh, by my colleagues uh, so far. So the first insight that I would like to share with you is passion. You know, passion is the fuel that propels us forward the winding road of academia. So you have to embrace your intellectual curiosity and follow your heart's desire. So if you do not have passion, it won't work. Because as you, as the others mentioned, it takes time. You, you have to be pas patient. So passion will help you to go through these, these difficulties. The second one is, of course, perseverance. Academia is not a linear path. It is filled with challenges, rejections, your, your your first paper, you know, you will write your first paper and there's 100% chance that it's going to be reject. But you have to persevere. And you will have some moments of self-doubt. So remember at that time that setbacks are part of the process and they do not define your real potential. Embrace, and it's really easy to, to say, but it's not easy to, uh, to uh, make it happen, but really embrace failures 
as stepping stones toward growth and learning. The third one, the third insight is, you heard, you heard it from my colleagues, building networks and collaboration. Connections, of course, are vital. So you have to seek opportunities to collaborate with few scholars and researchers. But I have to admit, select your partners. And um, if, you know, in a sense, you have to select partners that share similar values. And it's, it is really important because if they do not share your values, it won't work. And, and, um, and you have to also agree that uh, some of your partners have different strength than you are. And, and to, to, to support your collaborators in their, the best things they are a, being able to do, this is key also to build successful networks and successful collaboration. Mentorship, you heard about that. So it is really important, very, very important to find a mentor and a mentor who inspired and guided you. So you have to seek their advice. You have to share your ideas and learn from their experiences. If you're not listening, it won't work. You have to listen. Of course, you can discuss with your mentor. You can have different point of view, but you have to listen because they've been through all these challenges and difficulties. So they are the best people to support you and to help you to go through all these challenges. Publish, you heard, uh, you heard uh, Ralph, you heard Martina, you heard uh, uh, Chennai also, uh, to, uh, how the importance of publication. So, you have to share your research findings and it is really crucial to making an impact in academia. You have to publish in good journals. Uh, if uh, I come back to what Ralph was saying in project management, we have at least three good journals with impact factors. So try to, to, um, to publish in these, if, especially if you want to, to grow in the field of, pro of project management, you have to publish in the journals that focus on project management. Go to conferences as well. Conferences, it is the best place to build your network, to meet, um, to meet collaborators, to meet researchers, to meet also experienced researchers. In, in the field of project management, we have specific conferences where all people will be there. So it is for you a good opportunity to meet experienced researchers and, and they are very willing, you know, they have they are very nice to discuss and share their views with you. Of course, it is very easy to say you have to balance your work and life. It's not easy to uh, to make, believe me, <laughs> because there's always work that you can do during the weekends. There's always something that you can do on Sundays. I have to admit that um, I try to have at least Sunday free. Sunday, I don't work. I look after my fa my my family. I I I'm, I'm, I practice sports. I'm a black belt in karate, so this is a very important for me to practice karate. But there's days that I decided during the week that no way, no cell phones, no computers, nothing. If you want to survive, you have to decide to give you freedom to do nothing. And um, because academic life can be really, really demanding, and it is really easy to get consumed by it. And as Martina said, at a certain point you will get retired, and you don't want to be alone with your ton, your ton of books and your articles. They won't they won't look after you. They won't be there to. 
to share your uh, your pa your other passion or or discuss with you. So think about that. It's really important to balance your uh, your life. And risk continuous learning. Uh, academic excellence requires a commitment to uh, lifelong learning. Stay updated on the latest advancements in your field. Attend workshops, attend conference, and it is really uh, important to to know what are the hot topics. And Ralph mentioned that that with special issues, you know, this is a good a good opportunity. This is a good place to see what's going on on your field. And going to conferences also will help you to stay tuned on the, the hot topics. Of course, teaching and mentorship. Uh, don't underestimate the value of teaching and mentorship. Sharing knowledge with others not only not on, only enhances uh, your learning, but uh, their learning, but also reinforces your understanding of the subject matter. And I experience it with my kids. You know, uh, I'm not I'm not a good econo uh, I'm not very good in economy. And one day, my daughter came to me and said, "Mom, I understand nothing about economy." And I have to succeed. Uh, this I have to pass this course because I won't get my degree. And she was very nervous. I say, oh, okay. I, this is the topic I hate the most when I was at university, and I have to explain it to my daughter. So I took the book, her book. I read it from one page, from page one till on page hundred, and then I say, okay, what's the story? What can I tell her? How can I, first of all, understand what, I, what I'm talking about? And second of, uh, second of all, how can I explain it? So I just realized by forcing myself to explain to her in a simple manner, what is, you know, the curves, the graphs, the movement of demand. <laughs> and finally, I just realized that uh, I learned more in explaining in teaching her than I expected. So it works. I tried it. And, and when you explain something to someone else, you learn a lot as well. Contributing to academic community, you have to be an active participant in your academic community. So you have to, it, it means as a student, a PhD student, you should go to conferences. As early careers, you should present your work. And you should, if there's groups forming on, on like I have a research chair. So I welcome students and early career um, academics to, to come to my, uh, to be part of the activity of my research chair so it, it is like building a family being part of a family and uh, it also help you to contribute um, being part of this community and finally you have to believe in yourself believe in your abilities and the impact you can make in academia you are capable you have to tell yourself i'm capable I'm, uh, I'm capable of great achievements and transformative research. Have confidence in your ideas and the value of your contributions. But of course, don't be overconfident. You have to be humble at, at the same time. But you have to be, you know, you have to believe and con be convinced on what you are doing. And in conclusion, embrace this journey with determination, fueled by passion, and guided by perseverance. And you have to remember, success in academia is not just about achieving milestones. It's about having fun and, la and making a last impact on, on the world through your intellectual endeavors. So, it's nice, it's nice sometimes to say congratulations on choosing this path. And may your academic journey be filled with, with success, 
fulfillment, and a profound sense of purpose. And of course, you have to have fun. The future of academia, of course, lies in your hands. And I have no doubt that you will shape it in the most remarkable ways. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm looking forward to discuss uh, these in incredible insights and uh, this journey in academia with uh, my colleagues. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Drawn, for this great presentation. Uh, let's start our panel discussion. Uh, there were few keywords uh, in your uh, insightful presentations, which caught my attention, and I'm sure that uh, our participants also are also curious to know a little bit more. The first one or the first keyword was uh, maintaining a healthy work-life balance. Uh, and uh, as an early career researcher myself, uh, I am always thinking, how is it possible to work hard to build this uh, career and to also maintain a healthy work-life balance at the same time? Uh, and uh, I would be grateful if you could share your uh, advices with us uh, how to succeed in this uh, challenging task. I'm, maybe I can say a few words. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, you know, the way I was able to survive in a sense is, um, as I mentioned earlier, I am, at the same time I was conducting my career, I, I was um, practicing karate. And, um, and for me, it was my freedom. It was my moment of not having the kids asking to read books in economy, not having, you know, other issues with the family and not not getting worried about, uh, oh, I haven't finished this paper. I haven't finished this book chapter. I have to do it and I, I'm not ready for my courses. It is a time where I stop thinking and I start fighting in karate and if you don't concentrate in karate in who's in front of you then you you get you're gonna get hit very quickly so I had no choice to stop thinking of my task that I have to conduct and just to con and give and take this freedom this time to enjoy something else and I I, I think this is really important to have moment for you where you do nothing. Uh, I'm Ralph, yes, continue. Uh, continue, please. I'm not. Uh, I'm not karate girl like Natalie, but I think uh, what I can uh, relate to is to be in the moment. Yeah, uh, to be absolutely in the moment and do something that uh, that is joy for you and for me this is painting so i i love painting and um and uh, actually it was quite funny because i started it when my children were young and then i got so sucked up in my career and uh, i'm i'm not that, that terribly good in uh, keeping that balance yeah i also not that terribly good in saying no if uh, some offers come so i think what i learned is to say no and kind of really also make the distinction uh, is this now something i would like to do how does it help me yeah uh, how does it it kind of also fit into my values um and uh, what I have learned is that uh, I'm building up a lot of complexity all the time, yeah, taking on, taking on tasks, yeah. But then at a certain point, I have learned that I need to reduce the complexity, yeah. So one of the rules I have is if I take on a new position on something, uh, I also give up an old position. Very good. Yeah, I think this is a, a very good good rule. Uh, it's a little bit like buying shoes. Yeah, when I buy new shoes, I decide which ones of, of the old shoes I throw away. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a kind of the same principle. 
Um, but to, to join in on, on that discussion, I, I think uh, the, the key thing is to learn to say no. Yeah. Um, I I remember when when I was transitioning between two universities, I had a contract with them uh, that I work 50% of my time with the university I'm leaving, and I work 50% with the one I'm joining over a period of one year, ending up with the fact that I worked about 120% for each of them, yeah, with, uh, with uh, periods where I read up to 900 pages of master thesis a day, yeah, I, I taught at three universities, uh, different courses during that time. And then it hits me. Then I had a heart attack. Yeah. So uh, I learned from that. You, you need to scope what you can do and then rather say no than yes when it comes to a lot of work, um, accepting a lot of work. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. No, go ahead. Okay. Good. Uh, yeah, well, that that's in, in essence what, what I wanted to say. Yeah? Learn to say no, scope the work, and if it's just too much, either give up something else or say no to it. Yeah. Yes, Chimai. Yeah, no, I fully agree with what everybody else has said. I think you have to have that balance. It's probably the one that people struggle with the most because if you've got to get that paper in or that proposal, you stay up, you've got to meet that deadline. Uh, but then other things suffer. And I think one of the one of the most important really is your health. This work-life balance is really important for health. Because quite frankly, if anything happens to you, your university is probably going to be advertising your position before you're in the ground. <laughs> Yeah, nobody really cares that much. And that's part of why I say don't take yourself too seriously. Uh, and I think learning to say no is very important. It becomes easier the more senior you get because uh, as you're going up the, up the ladder, uh, all of those uh, requests are things you need to build your profile. And so you are tempted to say yes to this conference committee, yes to this editorial review, you know, all of those sorts of things. And it can become all consuming. Uh, we don't need a fair bit of discipline. You need to ring fence your life, uh, make time for yourself personally, make time for your family and significant others. Uh, also have some outside interests. Um, not only does karate, I play tennis. Uh, I, I'm never going to get a wild cat into Wimbledon, um, but at least I'm a reasonable club player and I go out there and I have fun. And that distracts me from, from the stresses of academic life. So you need all of those sorts of things. You need, a, I, say, I talked about a supporting infrastructure. You need colleagues in other disciplines at the same sort of rank who you can sit around, have coffee, discuss experiences, discuss strategies, you know, that is all part of uh, part of the work-life balance uh, because you can just have a good laugh uh, with friends and and others. Thank you very much for your uh, great uh, responses and insights. The other keyword uh, was mentoring and mentorship. So my question is that uh, who could be a good mentor? Uh, or how to characterize or how to identify a good mentor when we are looking for one? I'll just start by saying some uh, universities have formal mentoring programs. And so the minute you are appointed, you are assigned a mentor. Uh, we have, across the departments in my college, um, different approaches. Some are more formal than others. I'm a big advocate of the mentee choosing their mentor. Uh, otherwise, it could become like a forced marriage, and if it doesn't work, it becomes problematic. Uh, so I typically ask that the junior early career faculty spends at least the first semester, half a year, uh, a year to understand who um, the senior colleagues are, and then to identify who they are comfortable working with. But then we also have group mentoring of all the young faculty. I'll have regular sessions and I'll bring in different 
so there's the individual one-on-one -on -one mentoring, but then there's also room for group mentoring. Uh, and you can bring in speakers as appropriate depending on the topic. The other important point to make is that your mentor does not have to be from your institution. It can be somebody from a totally different university. Uh, I mentor junior faculty across the world. Uh, people call me and ask about different things and we have regular meetings. It takes a bit of my time. Uh, I don't get paid for it, but it's part of my uh, contribution back because when I was coming up, through the chance, I had some great mentors. Uh, I had people that I read my research proposals, gave me feedback before I ever submitted them. I had people that I could just call up and just uh, complain about whatever was bothering me and they would listen and offer me great advice. And, and I think the least I can do is offer the same uh, service to others. Uh, and I think, I think that's very important. Thank you. I think there's mentors for different uh, occasions, uh, I would say. Uh, you have uh, like uh, the first mentoring or support system should be actually doing the PhD and uh, your supervisors uh, uh, kind of. But uh, I mean, I think Ralph said it very nicely uh, that uh, you, you should knock on the doors of others. And Shimai, you were saying you are doing uh, also mentoring for other junior people outside uh, uni university. And I think uh, people should not be shy and approach. Yeah. And if it fits, it fits. Um, please be also not disappointed if it does not fit. Yeah. So sometimes if somebody approaches we, with a topic, I'm not an expert in, uh, I will just say, no, I'm not an expert in. Um, so that is, uh, I think this is important. And uh, what I said, there's, there's different uh, mentoring. So in an early uh, career, it will be more about uh uh, the topic, it will be very much topic related, uh, but uh, I think project management is a very nice community, not all uh, communities, academic communities, I would say are that open uh, as we are. Um, I think this is also why it's attracting similar people uh, to come in and also uh, work here and, and spend considerable time of, of, of their professional life and also private life partly uh, with the others. Um, I think to go to conferences, to knock on people's doors, uh, and uh, I think for me now, uh, my career kind of going into a transition like to another university in another uh, system. For me, it's uh, important now. And I found uh, a mentor who is helping me in that, yeah, giving me advice, helping me also explain uh, the UK system, which I partly do not understand because I have just grown up in another system. So what I'm saying here is that... Um, it's not always the 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 the, the mentor who is who is the older older person, but it might also be uh, the other way around. Yeah, so I think this is absolutely fine, and I think as a mentor, you're not only giving, but you're also kind of uh, taking and learning and also remain uh, up to date with some of the topics. Yeah, so I think it's kind of a giving and taking uh, at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, uh, Martina said a lot of things that I would like to say. I would like have had said, yeah. Uh, but um, I, I maybe stress once again the, the the fact of an informal mentor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we often get um, and mentors assigned at a university, but there's always the option of seeing somebody at a at a conference who is in the same field and makes a, 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 quite an impression. On, on you, why not asking that person whether he or she can be your informal mentor? I, I had many um, PhD students and postdocs and, and others who, who, who did that with me. And I don't remember ever turning such an opportunity down because as Martina said, it is also interesting for the mentor 
to uh, to get into new subjects and to to work with with other people. Yeah, so uh, don't be shy, but also be aware that that you approach these people friendly. Yeah, almost on a weekly basis, I get emails where people say, "Send me all you have published." in an email yeah not, not even saying dear ralph or, or anything yes yeah? so, um, that, that's not the way we interact in our community yeah be friendly yeah thank you very much yeah that's that's a good point um what i would like to add uh, two things um first of all of course it is important to find a supportive person within your organization Especially if you move to a new university, sometimes it could be very difficult to understand all the administration of a university, especially that if it's it is your first experience. And having a mentor outside your university is probably more important for your um, academic career in terms of publishing, in terms of, you know, understanding the world of publication. And I have to admit that Ralph Muller is uh, one of the best mentor I've met. <laughs> Why? There's three reasons for that. And uh, you have a good example with Ralph. Ralph is a lovely person, very nice person. And when you discuss with Ralph, you know, this, you have you you have the feeling that you are an important person and to build your confidence it is important very supportive as well we all know that ralph is very very busy but he is always there and very supportive but rigor rigor is also very important you want someone who's not easy going you want someone who will bring you to learn you, teach you how to be rigorous in your work. And this is also very important because this is key. Uh, we were talking about making a contribution. Contribution uh, goes with rigor. So this is, you know, uh, sorry, Ralph, I, 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 <laughs> I took you as a, a, a fantastic example. But to illustrate these three uh, characteristics uh, that a mentor should have, I think you were the best person. Thank you. I'm fully booked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For those who already plan to send me an email, I'm fully booked. I know. <laughs> I know. I didn't want to put you on the. Okay, call Ralph. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, before uh, I ask my third question, I want to take if uh, there is any question from the participants, from our um, uh, speakers today. So if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Okay, um, no hi. Yes. May I ask my question? Thank you so much to all of the great presentations and the discussion. I truly enjoyed all the insights and uh, valuable information shared. Um, I have this question that uh, usually we see a lot of people that shift between industry and academia. For instance, they work a couple of years in the industry and then decide to go back to academia and start their academic position or vice versa. Um, and they have bunch of different uh, reasons and motivations for this uh, how can we maintain that um, motivation and moving power constantly to to go forward and uh, be uh, be steady in our decisions and not move uh, back and forth between these two kind of diverse uh, realms so this is my question that uh, either you had experienced it, this kind of decisions in, in your career uh, or encountered people that are like that? And uh, what do you think is the solution to always stay motivated uh, in research and academia? Thank you. I will say a few things very quickly because I'm currently traveling and I'll need to go in a minute. Uh, one, straight after my PhD, I did not apply for a single academic position. I wanted to go in industry because I wanted to get the practical experience and become a chartered or professional engineer. So that was very important to me. And I found that doing that 
it was very helpful for both my teaching and research, because I now, in addition to all of the theoretical knowledge I'd gained through the PhD, I now had a practical experience. And my very first PhD student uh, did a project that actually built on my industry experience. Uh, but also, I don't think the two should be as diverse as we often think. Uh, we constantly work closely with industry and research. We constantly consult for industry. We constantly bring people from industry into the classroom uh, to provide case studies and give guest lectures. I think there needs to be a lot more interaction between the academy and industry. Uh, and so um, I certainly encourage junior faculty to uh, have those relationships. Uh, here in the US where faculty uh, academics uh, typically only employed for nine months, we have arrangements with some companies for our junior faculty to actually spend time in industry during the summer months, uh, just understanding how industry works. It gives them case studies, it gives them research, uh, research ideas, uh, but it also builds relationships, builds the network, and sometimes they get uh, support for some of their work. If, if I may add a few words from my side, uh, the, the motivation to keep me that keeps me in academia is the freedom. So I had a uh, I had a career in industry. I went up the ladder, uh, became worldwide director of project management at NCR Corporation in in the U.S. So that was quite a significant position. But I always had somebody who told me what to do. Yeah. And that's completely different in the academic world. I choose my topics. Yeah, I choose the people I want to work with. Yeah, I choose how much I publish. Yeah, whether I write a book or not, it's simply my my decision. Yeah, and um, from that perspective, I have absolutely no intention to go back to the uh, industry where the daily question is, what will be the profit by next Monday? Yeah, so. Uh, I, I enjoy the freedom and I also must say I enjoy publishing. So once a paper is out, I actually take the time, lean back and read my own paper very slowly, much slower than I, I read it when I write it. Yeah, but in, enjoy the fact that this is out. Yeah, this will be there when I'm gone. Yeah, so this is long lasting. Yeah, so that's uh, that, that's a very different form of, of a satisfaction through the work than you have in the industry. Now, I, I just say that you have said what I wanted to say. With <laughs> For me, is uh, the freedom is uh, absolutely uh, important. And you, you still, I mean, this depends now a little bit on the context uh, you are in, in academia. Yeah? Uh, and of course, also on this career stage, how much freedom you have. Um, and uh, in early career st stages, you might have not that much freedom. Uh, but in later stages, as we are in now, I really enjoy my freedom. And I really, this is what I meant when I said I have built a career what I always dreamt of. Yeah. So uh, I love teaching. I love researching. I love traveling. Yeah. I love developing things. And this is what my career is built on. Um, was there a, a decision at a certain time? I told you that my my first professor, my supervisor, he he's a very famous consultant, yeah, and uh, he wanted me to become a consultant and work in the consulting company. And I I like to do consultancy, but that would not be my life. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, I think you, you feel it. What, what, uh, what gives passion to you, as Natalie said, uh, what kind of drives you and um, yeah, but at a certain point of time, I had to decide whether do I want to be a consultant and go in a consultancy and become partner there. Or uh, do I want to remain in, in academia? And I decided for academia. Yeah. So sometimes you just need to make a decision. Do I uh, want to become a full-time partner in a consultancy? No, not at the moment. 
No, I don't think so, because I'm enjoying my freedom at the university. And uh, I'm not so much measured on, on the profit I'm bringing in. But that might also be different in different contexts. And I fully agree with freedom. You know, freedom, we have freedom in academia. And um, I, I work as a corporate lawyer in uh, international law firms before, you know, joining the academia. And I have to admit that um, I was working night and days, uh, driving, you know, do uh, writing documents and, and, and the whole night and, and, and then having the closing the next morning and things like that. So I was working all the time, not having fun. And I didn't like it. The pressure of delivering and delivering for deals, I didn't, I really didn't enjoy it. And I didn't, at the time, uh, I had two kids and I couldn't, I didn't see them, you know, someone else was raising my kids. So at a certain point of my life, I said, okay, what do I want? And um, joining the academia, I realized that brought me freedom and i have to admit at my university the first summer i was uh, you know driving every day to my office sitting in my office and i just realized after one week that i was alone i say where are my colleagues i'm the only one at the office so i went to the the department and i asked where are the colleagues and they said they are home nobody comes at the university during summertime there's something else to do and I was shocked. I said, well, at my law firm, you have to be there night and days. And in at my university, they don't even ask you where you are. So that was, that was a, I have to admit, a big shock. And I told myself, are they, are they really working? And of course, they are working, but working differently. Um, so we still have pressure, we have pressure to publish, but we have freedom to choose when we put efforts to deliver what we have to deliver. Thank you very much. Uh, any other question from our participants? Okay, so I'm gonna ask the last question as we are already uh, you're running out of time. So something that early career researchers are facing every day, stronger than yesterday, is the competitive environment for getting academic positions. And in this competition, uh, are, if not all, but most of universities or research organizations, they are requiring a very uh, how to say impressive uh, publication track from PhD students or from postdocs. And uh, to build such publication track, uh, there, there comes, uh, how to say, a challenge. So if we want to have publications with high quality, they are of course time consuming for early career researchers, both in terms of writing and then getting them published in very well-known journals because it doesn't happen in one month or two months or three months. Sometimes it takes two years. And uh, this question may come to mind of early career researchers. How do we make a balance between the quality and quantity of our publications to build our career at the beginning? Well, if I shall start, um, I think partly I, I answered that in my in my presentation. Um, if you if you assume that that you publish so that it the stuff you publish is read and appreciated by by the people of your community, then you build up a reputation, yeah, and then you might be able to get a job at a university without having published in their preferred journals. For example, I work at BI Norwegian Business School. B 
We have a very clear policy. You have to publish in four-star journals. I don't have a single paper in a four-star journal. Yeah. Still, they hired me 12 years ago as a, as a professor. Yeah. Because all these rules say, or equivalent. Yeah. So um, apparently they, they have seen my publications as equivalent to the, the minimum requirement of four-star uh, journals that they have in their policies. Yeah. And I think that has to do with the fact that people knew me. Yeah, I went to conferences, I talked with a lot of people, I worked with a lot of people. And these people then, they assessed my work when I applied for professorship there. And they said, Ralph is eligible for it. Yeah, even though he might not fulfill 100% what the university dreams of. Yeah, and I think maybe it is, it is a bit high that I think here, but I think the I did not make a bad choice in hiring me, yeah. So um, from that perspective, this, this small thing in the policies here yeah, or equivalent can be quite uh, an important part. Yeah. Thank you. Natalie, you wanna go next? Yeah, and it's... Um... It also depends, you know, of the rules, as, as Ralph said, but the rules of, at your university. Some universities will also put a lot of, lots of, uh, lot of emphasis on your community contribution. Uh, and for instance, at my university, of course, they put uh, emphasis on publication, but then they also look at, uh, are you a balanced academic? Uh, researcher or professor so they look at what is your contribution to uh, teaching what is your contribution to publication and what is your contribution of uh, community services so they and then you can decide your percentage you can say okay when you assess my 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 file you you would I would like you to focus more on what I have done and at my community services or what you have done what I have done at my academic or pub or um, um, teaching so this is really you know the rules are different from universities and the emphasize on publication can be different I have um, I have colleagues at my university I think they they publish over their career three papers and uh, so they are not they are not researchers, but as Ralph present the uh, in his uh, slides, they are they have an administrative career, and university also you know enjoy having mis uh, uh, professors and and colleagues who are focusing because on academic administrative tasks because they need also colleagues that will take over these tasks these tasks so it it is in summary it is how you you sell yourself uh internally and you you uh, value what you have done within the rules and this is really important and as a lawyer i can say that you have to play with the rule and if you have a space for equivalent so value your work in the space of being at uh, in the criteria of equivalent, and there's value in that as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a it's a decision, uh, and I think Ralph said it very nicely in his uh, presentation. Uh, it's uh, how much do you want to obey? Yeah, or Natalie say play with the rules. Um, I have never obeyed the rules completely at my university. Um, and I even refused them for a while, uh, which was not so uh, clever. Uh, because, of course, you need to obey to a certain extent. Yeah, But the extent is also your decision. And... Um, so it's about the rules, the number of papers you need to have where, but at the end of the day, if you have a name out, yeah, and if you have a reputation, uh, if you're a well-established uh, scholar, um, 
then this counts, yeah, and this counts uh, very well. Um, I think the expectations are becoming increasingly higher, yeah, so uh, three-star publication, four-star publications. Uh, sometimes I, I, I wonder how, how people should get that, yeah, uh, how they can fulfill that at all. Um, I mean, I, I did just a decision at a certain point of time. I care, but not too much about the rules and I do my thing. And at the end of the day, uh, it's not only kind of reaching a certain milestone, but you would also like to have a, a life and joy in the process. Yeah? And that was my personal decision I took. Yeah? Thank you very much. Very informative, indeed. Uh, okay, I guess we are at the end of this webinar. Uh, if if you have any question, or dear participants, please ask. If not, uh, then perhaps we can conclude uh, the webinar by thanking our great speakers with their wonderful uh, presentations and. Uh, insights okay i guess there is no question anymore thank you again thank you very much for your participation uh it was very insightful to be here today in this webinar and i'm sure that uh, everybody has learned a lot and will learn will when the, they watch uh, the webinar thank you very much thank, thank you for joining us thank you very much yeah thank you bye, bye.